suburbs, almost as much written about as Madison Avenue, and just as much in need of reflection. Like Madison Avenue, life in the suburbs has its good moments, and others not so good. glad to be here. It takes a while for a young couple to realize all they're in for when they buy a house or when they have a baby. And when they buy a house and have a baby. So hardly realizing it, they come into their purchasing stage and are off on a wild non-stop ride. Happy go spending world reflected in the windows of the suburban shopping centers where they go to buy. The shopping centers see these young adults as people whose homes are always in need of expansion. People who buy in large quantities and truck it away in their cars. It's a big market. These young adults shopping with the same determination that led them to the suburbs in the first place are the going as part of a nation on wheels, living by the automobile, the first young adults in the age of the push button. Americans, by and large, love suburbia. It has promised space, affordability, convenience, family life, and upward mobility. After half a century of constant development, more than half our population has moved here. And as the population of suburban sprawl has exploded, so too the suburban way of life has become embedded in the American consciousness. Suburbia and all it promises has become the American dream. But as we enter the 21st century, serious questions are emerging about the sustainability of this way of life. Does the suburban dream have a future? The whole suburban project, I think, can be summarized pretty uh, succinctly as the greatest misallocation of resources in the history of the world. America took all of its post-war wealth 
and invested it in a living arrangement that has no future. The basic cause of it all is, is the end of cheap and abundant energy. Cheap oil is the party that we've been enjoying for the past 150 years. And uh, that party is coming to a, uh, an end. Within our lifetimes, we're going to see uh, the end of the age of oil. And the result of that will be the end of the American way of life. Here, in a typical North American suburb, life seems to be carrying on much as it has for the past 50 years. With every passing year, more and more streets like this one replace farmers' fields as more and more people come here for their share of the good life. History, however, has proven itself indifferent to people's hopes and dreams for a better life. Even the best of intentions have often not been enough to avoid calamity. And suburbia began with the best of intentions. The dream of the suburbs was the antidote to city life, and in particular, the life of the industrial city and the industrial town. And the antidote was going to be country living for everybody. And the suburbs was a way of delivering that to the masses. The industrial city and the industrial town were really things that had never been seen before. You know, they were new. Human beings didn't have experience with them and with all the terrible things that they produced. So, you know, the towns and cities of North America grew up in tandem with the industrial processes and were very much products of industrialism. And what happens pretty early in the process by the mid-19th century is that the industrial city becomes a fairly horrible place. There's all this noise and effluence and pollution and stenches and all these terrible byproducts of uh, factories and people don't want to live around that stuff anymore and then you get the additional problems of you know you you need armies of workers to uh, toil in these factories which are assuming increasingly immense scale the quarters that they live in end up being these vast tenement slums you know this idea establishes itself in I think the collective consciousness of all of us North Americans, that the city is not really a very good place to live. Uh, and what is the alternative? Well, there's the city and there's a country. Certainly the first suburbs in the late 19th century enabled the better off upper middle class to get away from these moiling and toiling uh, workers and all their vulgar worker culture of the cities. In the 1870s and 80s you, and 90s, you get the first template, which is uh, the suburb based on uh, the idea of the manor in a park, you know, the, the estate in a park. And these are subdivisions like Llewellyn Park in New Jersey and Riverside, nine miles outside the Chicago Loop, which are basically large Victorian villas deployed in a park-like setting. You know, in the beginning, there must have been elements of it that were lovely because the first people who were moving out there were, were pretty well off. And they were moving to real countryside. There were no Kmarts in 1897. Then in the late 19th, early 20th century, before World War I, you get something quite different. You get the, the, the streetcar suburb, which is based on this idea of the streetcar lines now leaving the city and these new uh, suburbs, which are still fairly civic in their physical design. There were these stops, and each one of these stops created a beautiful little main street and smaller, higher density housing, cottages, bungalows nearby, all very walkable in the most traditional sense. And they are some of the most wonderful uh, neighborhoods in America. They're, they're just outside the central cities. Then what happens is in the 1920s, you get the mass motoring democratization of suburbia. And that results in the boom of the 1920s, largely based on creating these automobile suburbs and all of their furnishings and accessories. And that project is interrupted by the Great Depression and the Second World War. No, sir. All this can't keep a fella from putting down his ideas. Something is going to add up here. Zone air-conditioned castle with a deep breeze. 
cool for beer. A great big lawn where Bet and Pupsy will welcome them home. Veterans Emergency Housing Program is launched to help solve the housing emergency in hundreds of cities. The target, 2,700,000 homes and apartments started by the end of 1947. This is the payoff to our soldiers who fought in World War II. You get to come home, you don't have to live in a city anymore. You can live in a brand new home in the suburbs and you're gonna have a wife who can stay at home and a family, and that's the payout. And that became a packaged Mer American dream, but it's only a post-World War II American dream. It's not the true American dream of anybody can make it. Almost overnight, suburbia was born. A half million homes sprang up around the country in 1946. Nearly a million in 1947. A million in 1948. Still more in 1949, 1950. The empty farmlands, the quiet towns and villages surrounding the city found themselves in the midst of a roaring housing boom. You get the real full elaboration of the automobile suburb based on the idea of the cul-de-sac subdivision and that becomes the template for how we're going to build things. And this is the only part of the world at that time where, you know, plumbers and pipe fitters and sheetrock hangers could own their own home. The middle class is going to go basically from the wino level clear up to, you know, the doctors and the dentists. And everybody will be included. You'll find a scene like this in nearly every village, town and city throughout the country. For in the hopes and dreams of everyone, there's a home they can call their own. Home brings a sense of security to a man. And to every woman, her home means a setting for gracious living. And we'll have the living room right in here. And the kitchen right here so we can see the children playing in the yard. And we have shrubbery, of course, right along in here. And, oh, darling, it's going to be just perfect. One of the things that happens is that uh, suburbia ends up being a false promise. The post-war suburbia is not what it promises to be. It's not country living. It's a cartoon of country living and a cartoon of a house. You know, it has none of the real amenities of country life, no connection with real organic systems of other living things, you know, rivers, forests, fields, uh, agriculture, none of that. You know, you just get a lawn, you know, which is an industrial produced artifact. So it has none of the amenities of country life and it, it has none of the amenities of the town. And in fact, it has all the disadvantages of both. You know, all you really have is a six lane highway. And so it is that all of us in interdependence live independently on wheels. The idea is that everybody's going to live in a country house. And one of the results of that is that the American cities and towns are absolutely gutted in the period of 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Increasingly, we are seeing large-scale demolition as the first step in building modern cities. Getting needed space in our cities for modern structures is the only way to meet the competitive force of growing suburban strength. Often, the substance of our urban structures is such as to resist the power of the demolition hammer. From now on, we shall be seeing much demolition, the first step in making our cities better places to work, better places to live. It will take great effort and real leadership, but as a people, we can do the jobs. And as we see here the rubble of demolition at the feet of Columbus, let us remember that in many ways the continent is still before us. The American city is decanted into the countryside, and all of its functions soon follow. The shopping, uh, the, the, the office, uh, the retail, everything follows. As growing numbers of North Americans moved to the suburbs, one of the challenges facing policymakers was how to get all these people from their homes to their shopping malls, to their workplaces, and their schools, and back again. The major American auto manufacturers were powerhouses of industrial might following the Second World War. And they had a plan for the masses, 
It relied, not surprisingly, on cars as America's future mass transit. The growth of suburbs has brought another major problem, getting there and back. Without cars, suburbia wouldn't be possible. But once we live in suburbia, even where there are trains and buses serving the suburbs, most people have to depend on cars. Each year, there are more of them. Each year, there must be more highways and expressways to take care of them. Originally, the suburbs were places that developers actually paid for light rail systems and streetcars to go to in order to make the land viable, places to live. GM and Firestone and, and um, I think Standard Oil were actually convicted of conspiring to destroy the light rail systems across the United States. They literally bought them up and tore them out so that they could sell GM buses with Firestone wheels that run with uh, Standard Oil. Simultaneously, you had the Federal Highway Program. A Better Highways contest was recently conducted. Purpose? Arouse nationwide thinking on how to plan and pay for the safe and adequate highways we need. Highway experts wrote essays. privileged to present the winner of the Grand National Award, Robert Moses of New York. Robert Moses, New York City construction coordinator, is a world-famous highway planner, a man who knows his business. No magic will suddenly produce roads commensurate with cars. The remedies are neither easy nor cheap nor immediately realizable. But the task you have set is not beyond the capacity of the aroused American people. Will you stop honking, Mac? We ain't going nowhere. You think you got it made. Good job. Carnally paid for. So you get a little home in the suburbs, away from the city smoke, out from the shadows of the factory. Raise a few kids, some flowers and vegetables. The big dream coming true. There is this specific American dream that got packaged and sold and subsidized, highly, highly subsidized. So subsidized that to continue it, it is a deep question of whether we can afford to continue that level of subsidy. And it is unsustainable. The interstate highways have become continuous bands of suburban development. From, I mean, you could go from Maine to Florida on Interstate 95 and never see open countryside. It's become a continuous city. And the density of population in those areas is extremely low. It's not economic to build railroads or even bus lines are uneconomic in those vast areas of sprawl because population density is so low. The only uh, uh, efficient way to travel is by individual automobile. Distances people drive are quite considerable. 50, 100 miles a day is not unusual for commuters who live in these outer suburban areas. Every county within 50 miles of an interstate highway has shown population growth, and every county outside 50 miles of an interstate highway has declined. This is essentially completely going in the wrong direction. The suburbs wouldn't exist if it weren't for cheap oil. Um, the U.S. is a car culture. The automobile industry started in the U.S. And really the automobile industry got, it got its start here because we were looking for ways to use that cheap oil. The U.S. was awash in oil in the early 20th century. In the 1930s, they were discovering the stuff so fast that uh, oil in Texas was cheaper than drinking water by the carload. The car companies quickly became the engine driving U.S. industry and economic growth. The result of this is that uh, 
we have created this new system of habitation where people live miles and miles from where they work and from where they get their food and all of, all of their other necessities based on the idea that they can and they must hop in their car at any moment and, and travel miles and miles. And the only way that works is on the basis of, of cheap energy. Now we're stuck up a cul-de-sac in a cement SUV uh, with an empty gas tank. Across North America, we arrive in our cars, trucks, and SUVs at gas stations like this. We expect to fill our tanks with gas at prices half those of Europe and much of the rest of the world. We expect endless natural gas to heat our homes. And we expect endless natural gas to generate the increasing amounts of electricity that we consume. Cheap, plentiful and dependable fossil fuels have made our contemporary life possible. Everything from our trains and buses, our cars and trucks, our heating in the winter months and cooling in the summer, all are dependent on cheap and reliable fossil fuel energy. And there is no other way of life that uses more of this energy than suburbia. It is cheap and abundant fossil fuels that pave, lubricate, and drive the turbo growth of our suburban development. On and on, this way of life expands into farmers' fields, meadows, and hinterland, offering up six lanes of the American dream with no end in sight. What the blackout actually was, it was a whole series of fuse boxes all tripping as we approached 100% capacity. And, and at the heart of the matter was the fact that we basically had a very mild summer. And on the 14th of August, that was the first day all summer that we were approaching 90 degree temperature at peak all the way from the eastern shores of Lake Michigan to the Atlantic Ocean, from Toronto, Montreal, Quebec, all the way down to Washington, D.C., Cincinnati, St. Louis. And as we were approaching that, we were clearly getting higher and higher and higher towards the 100% mark because of air conditioning demand. And when are you most vulnerable? You're most vulnerable in peak summer weather between 4 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Because A, that's when weather tends to be the hottest. And B, that's when you have all three users of electricity online at the same time. Industrial, commercial, and residential. So when did the blackout happen? Ironically, 413. The question wasn't the event. The question was, why did we ever allow ourselves to get so near peak capacity that it took just a branch or two to end up denying 57 million people light for several days? Everything in society that we cherish ended when the blackout came. Uh, and if that wasn't a fire drill for how important energy actually is, I can't imagine it. But you know what? People didn't get it. It wasn't a yellow light. It was a big red light. And I don't think we basically learned a thing from it. Matthew Simmons is the president and CEO of Simmons & Company in Houston, Texas. It's the world's largest energy investment bank. His clients include the World Bank, Kerr McGee, Halliburton, Bechtel. I mean, he is, handles the biggest of the big. Matt Simmons was incredibly clear and articulate that, look, folks, we've backed ourselves into the corner. We have committed to natural gas fired plants. There's really no other alternative. Coal fired plants are very uh, polluting. Nuclear is way too expensive, the, uh, and, and there's too much opposition. And hydroelectric is all used, so we're stuck with gas. But he said, there's not going to be any more generating capacity built. 
Why? Because there's nothing to power the plants with. And who, he asked, would take a 1% return on investment, you know, for a $150 million investment in a power generating station if they know there's nothing to power the plant and no way to, to, to generate any revenue from it? We're coming to rely more and more on natural gas for electricity generation, and natural gas is becoming more scarce. Natural gas is no longer able to be extracted out of the ground at the same colossal rate as it has been to satisfy the enormous hunger and growing demand of North America um, for natural gas. Once anyone that knows what they're talking about uh, comes to the realization that natural gas supplies are in decline, then you immediately have to jump to the next, to the next consequence. We have to grow electricity or we will not grow our economy because I don't think there is any serious economist that could argue that our economy could grow by 2 to 3 percent per year and keep electricity use flat. Economic growth is predicated upon more electricity. Electricity is predicated upon hydrocarbon energy, period. And Matthew Simmons made a very clear statement. He said future growth is not possible. And for a guy from his background to say that was one of the most, uh, that's, th th that's like the Catholic Church saying the earth is round before Galileo. Normal for us is using immense amounts of electricity and, and oil to transport ourselves around. Normal is living in suburbs. Normal is consuming like there's no tomorrow. At some point, we will discover that this normal way of life has come to an end. The 2003 blackout that denied power to 57 million people has been officially blamed on a falling branch and faulty transmission lines. Matthew Simmons believes that deeper causes exist, that North America is reaching the limits of its generating capacity due to short-sighted energy planning and political hubris. The future of electricity generation in America is being committed to a resource now in decline in America, natural gas. If it is conceivable that such gross mismanagement is leading us into an energy crisis, if it is possible that our policymakers and specialists have made such an historic mistake, what other mistakes might they have made? What have we not been told about the future of oil? Most people, when they, they think about oil, uh, think of when we're going to run out. And really, that's the wrong question to ask, because oil in the earth is not like oil or uh, gasoline in the gas tank of your car. Uh, when your car runs out of gas, then you know there's a problem. Uh, and it, but it doesn't run out until you get to the, the last drops. But with oil in the earth, it's a very different situation. We can't just pump oil out of the earth at any arbitrary rate. All oil production, whether it's in one oil field or one country or the planet as a whole, always follows a bell curve. When you drill your first well, if the oil's close to the surface under pressure, you get a gusher. You drill more wells, the pressure goes down, the table goes down. But also you're pumping out the light sweet oil, which has risen to the top, the heavier uh, more expensive oil to refine, the harder to get oil, is obviously way down deep. And you have to start putting in, pumping in water or carbon dioxide or natural gas if you've got some around and to start forcing the oil out, just as is happening in Saudi Arabia. So what you get is this curve. It, it starts, um, pulls up quite quickly, you get more and more and more out, then you reach this peak or plateau. When you get to about the halfway point, the rate of, that you can extract the resource be, uh, peaks. And after that point, no matter how much effort you put into it, you can't continue extracting the resource at the same rate. The rate of extraction peaks and begins to fall. We're sort of in the middle right now. We're right at the peak. We're at the point where the world is producing the most oil it will ever produce. And uh, we are going to enter the arc of decline uh, very shortly, if not already. It's a little bit unclear whether or not we've actually already entered it. It's one of these phenomena that you only can say that with, with phenomenal, yes, we are sure, when you look back in a rearview mirror and say, uh, gosh, obviously we peaked, but usually by the time it's clear, it's so far in the past that you're well into a, di a totally different era. 
And once it goes into that decline, it's a permanent kind of a decline. It might be a bumpy decline. And then you've got yourself a gap between what you want to use and what the supply is. Peaking means categorically that you no longer grow. The effect of crossing over the peak means, in essence, that every barrel of oil that you produce from that moment on will be more expensive. It will, will require more energy to get out of the ground, and it'll be a lesser quality of oil. The guy that basically is, is most renowned for picking the peaking concept uh, was a person named N, Dr. M. King Hubbard. M. King Hubbard was um, probably the most uh, famous and influential geologist of the 20th century. Uh, he worked for the U.S. Geological Survey. He worked for oil companies like Shell and their research division. In 1956, at some industry convention, he made a startling speech and put up a bunch of graphs that basically said from all of his calculations, sometime in the early 1970s, the United States of America would peak as an oil province. And once we reached that point, it didn't matter how much we drilled, how fast we drilled, what the price of oil was, we would basically start into decline. Very few people took him seriously, in, in spite of the fact that he was so uh, universally respected. Of course, uh, U.S. oil production did, in fact, peak in, in 1970-71. Uh, and as a result of that, a few more people started, started to take him seriously. If you go back and you read the U.S. petroleum history, one of the most incredible ironies, in my opinion, is that in 1970, Dr. Hubbard's reputation was in shambles. And the thing that his critics just said in glee, in print, all the time, was, remember that old guy that said we were going to run out of oil in the early 70s? Look, the United States has never produced more than this year, the year we peaked. It seemed to take the better part of a decade or more before the oil experts in the United States looked back and said, isn't this interesting? We've clearly peaked. He uh, um, went on to predict a global oil production peak for the mid-1990s, which probably would have been accurate if it hadn't been for the uh, oil shocks of the 1970s, which drove oil prices so high that they destroyed demand. And as a result of that, uh, oil production actually decreased for the first time in history during the early 1970s. And this had the effect of delaying the global oil production peak for probably 10 or 15 years. The only scientists that seem to have taken this really seriously are the old timers. Whereas the young guys are mesmerized by the technology. We created a generation and a half of Nintendo geologists that sit at their workstation and basically move around images until I say, wow, look at that bright spot. The books on oil have been as cooked as the books at Enron. In the late 1980s, virtually all of the Arab oil countries reported extraordinary reserve increases of something like uh, 50 to 100 percent just within a year or two. And this wasn't related to any huge new discoveries. It was mostly political because OPEC was contemplating new rules at the time that would say that uh, a country could expand its rate of uh, production and oil sales commensurate to its reserves. So there was this incentive to report increased reserves in order to increase market share. But the evidence that that oil that has been reported as reserves is actually there is, is very flimsy. So we don't actually know how much oil is in Saudi Arabia or Iraq for that matter. Is there 115 billion barrels of oil in Iraq as is uh, noted in the, in the press again and again? Or could it be 40 billion or 60 billion? We don't really know. Experts like uh, Matt Simmons, the pessimists, are saying that it's, it's probably on the, on the low side. Uh, Saudi Arabia may have already peaked. If it turns out that Saudi Arabia has peaked, then categorically the world has peaked. The debate over the peaking of oil on the planet has begun. And for the scientists involved, it is not so much a question of if or how, but when. It's a 
pleasure for me to open this uh, uh, ASPO seminar. We need to recognize that the issue of the peak oil production is an open-ended debate. My feeling is that we are going to run into serious trouble by 2010, more or less. The peak has happened, and now, <clears throat> instead of being uh, prophets, we're now historians. When it comes to estimates by the well-informed folks, I mean, it almost feels like you're throwing darts. Uh, there are so many, and, and yet they're, they're, they're grouping fairly, they're starting to group tighter. Most of them uh, end up projecting a peak by or before 2020. I detect it on many sides now that there is a growing awareness. We've moved beyond asking if there is a peak to ask uh, how big it is, how soon it is, and, and more than that, what we might do about it. It's no longer sort of the, the words of some crank in the wilderness. It's becoming, and it has to become, uh, very topical. It's going to come to suburbia uh, probably much sooner rather than later. I happen to agree with many of the people we heard here that peak oil is here now. Now that we know there's no unused surplus oil in the Middle East, sorry, that's it. And so we probably have passed the Hubbard peak. I think it's between 2005 and 2007. That's what my model shows. Uh, we always were afraid. What would it be like to live after the Hubbard peak with world oil declining? And I have this list of things. Seven trillion dollars lost out of the U.S. stock market. Two million jobs lost in the United States. Federal budget surplus gone. State budget surplus is gone. Uh, the middle class disappearing. Peaking is not equivalent to running out. Everyone in the room knows this, but the lack of the people outside this room understanding that uh, is, is uh, that's a serious problem. The problem of oil depletion, and which will result in the increase in prices of petroleum, is the way it'll be experienced by the ordinary American, will have a catastrophic effect on American society, because in the past 20 years, American society has been more than ever before dispersed outside of center cities into the bands of territory around the major cities what we call sprawl or, you know, the outer suburbs. I'm sorry to say, really, that the suburban uh, family in, in America is really going down the wrong path. So what is the impact on the ordinary citizen uh, around? Well, for a few years, he can buy another large car. He can uh, smile that there's not a cloud on the horizon. And then the crisis, when it hits, is that much worse. And there's a strange irony in this business because the more efficient you are in producing the stuff, the more skilled you are, all the good things that one generally sees as positive attributes, the better you are at doing this, all you are really doing is accelerating the depletion and making the situation worse. The other big squeeze in the suburbs is going to be home heating. And as most homeowners already know, at times that can get expensive. And this last winter, it was particularly wild. We almost ran out of gas in the Northeast. We barely made it uh, in the sense that, the, you know, the red light lit that says low on fuel. The United States is, is uh, reliant for only 15% of its natural gas from Canada. Conversely, the people in the United States are clueless about the fact that that very same 15% is over half of Canada's production. If people in the United States think that that relationship can go on forever, given that natural gas production has just peaked in North America, they're crazy. And we need to adjust in the natural gas realm more rapidly, more aggressively uh, than we do in the oil realm. There are absolutely no quick solutions. Zero. God does set his own limits. I believe that he likes to test humankind from time to time. And I think the test is going to come very, very soon. The end of cheap oil and gas is coming. But we have all come to take for granted their benefits. 
Our affluence in North America, our new cars, our suburban lifestyles, all this is dependent on an abundance of cheap oil and gas. What will be the consequences as fossil fuels become more scarce and more expensive? We've had this incredible period of 50 years of relative world peace and stability. And I think that it's put uh, the, the American public into a kind of consensus trance that the world has always been stable, that there's very little relative danger to us in these things that happen around the world, and that we'll probably prevail uh, in the face of all of these things, and that our so-called economy will just keep on chugging along no matter what. It's in everybody's interest to maintain the facade that this, is, this way of life is normal. This is what we should expect. This is what we should expect for our children. And by golly, we should go out and continue buying and consuming like there's no tomorrow. The, the economic benefits of living in a very stable world, meaning we're not at war with China, that means that we can enjoy a lot of benefits of having them manufacture all our stuff. We're used to getting all of our household goods now from 12,000 miles away. They're made in China. You know, everything from frying pans to underpants. What's going to happen if those supply lines to China uh, are interrupted? You know, what, what might happen if we have a contest with the Republic of China over the remaining oil in the Middle East and Central Asia? Is Walmart going to continue to, you know, get the steady stream of uh, everything from toilet seats to fishing rods from Chinese factories? In North America, I think that we're going to have to downsize and downscale everything we do. Everything from farming to education to the way we deploy ourselves in living in the landscape, sports. You know, everything that we do is going to have to be made smaller. The age of the 3,000-mile Caesar salad is coming to an end. We're going to have to grow more food closer to where we live around our towns. Not only will food prices skyrocket, but the ability of the North American continent to produce food will diminish rapidly. The so-called Green Revolution, which took place in the 40s and 50s, saw a, a, an incredible explosion in the amount of food produced on the North American continent. A field of carrots never touched by a hoe. A petroleum-derived weed killer knocked out the weeds when the carrots were only sprouts. Agricultural experts fight an endless battle against insect pests that ruin millions of dollars worth of crops a year. Oil-based sprays and oil-derived chemicals are among their most effective weapons. Soil degradation uh, is, uh, has effectively rendered much of our agricultural land to be nothing more than a sponge onto which we pour petroleum-based chemicals to grow food. Not only are all fertilizers made out of natural gas, all commercial pesticides are made from petroleum. Not to mention the energy that's used in planting, harvesting, pumping the water for irrigation, packaging the food, processing the food, transporting the food, etc. There's really going to be an end to that. And when it ends, we're going to be in real trouble. You know, it's not going to be just a matter of not being able to drive to the mall. It's going to be a matter of not, not knowing how you're going to feed your children. In the U.S. and North America, we consume 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy for every calorie of food we eat, not counting transportation and cooking. That's an enormous uh, out-of-balance equation. A lot of people, I think, are going to be engaged in the uh, production of food in ways that they can't imagine right now. Farming is liable to become a lot more labor-intensive in the years ahead, meaning, you know, a lot more people are going to have to work at it. How are people going to get to their work? What kind of work is there going to be? Who's actually going to do the real work of creating things of value? Especially when we can't get toilet seats from China anymore. We're going to have to reorganize uh, local and regional networks of economic interdependency in which local people produce things, sell things, move things around on a much smaller and more local scale. In the United States, we have a railroad system that the Bulgarians would be ashamed of. You know, we desperately are going to need railroad transport 
for moving people around, for moving goods around. And we don't have that. What we do have is a trucking system, which is probably going to become increasingly um, uh, dysfunctional, especially as the, uh, the expense mounts of maintaining the tremendous interstate highway system, which costs so much money every year to maintain it, what the engineers call a high level of service, which means that the, the trucks that are, are delivering things from the Central Valley of California to Toronto don't break their axles while they're bringing those Caesar salads to Toronto. Once you have a certain number of trucks that are breaking their axles in that 3,000 mile journey, that's the end of transcontinental trucking, which also implies that's the end of, of certain economic relationships that we've gotten used to. The Walmarts of uh, North America have very efficiently and effectively destroyed almost every local and regional network of economic commercial interdependency and those networks are going to have to be rebuilt. We're going to have to learn how to do retail again on the local level and we're not prepared for that and it's a tremendous awesome project. Consequences of global oil peak for the average family may not be immediately apparent. Because uh, energy prices and the economy are so closely intertwined, that would probably result in an economic recession. The underlying direction of events would be toward decreased economic activity because there would be less energy available to fuel economic activity. And people would be wondering why we're in recession after recession and why every recession seems to be a little bit worse than the last one. And it takes longer to get out of it and then we never quite get out of the recession until finally it would come to the point after a few years where uh, the, the, uh, the recession would, would turn into really a, 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 an economic depression. And in this case, it will be one that, that never ends. Those who've been uh, born in or moved to suburbia uh, tend to feel that there's a, a birthright to the lifestyle they've, they, they enjoy. There's the three-car garage, the large lawn, the even larger house. Uh, consumption of resources is just something you take for granted and you pay a bill for monthly. Um, that that will change and that will be a jarring change when it comes. Um, it will be, it will feel like an ambush. I think we will see a lot of denial. I think we will see, uh, particularly when imminent nat nat natural gas uh, catastrophes happen, when we see natural gas prices go up ten times in the course of a month uh, by a multiple of ten, uh, and we see gasoline prices go to four dollars a gallon, you know, we'll see all these rationales to blame somebody else. Their immediate natural gut reaction will be that they've been, they've been gypped by somebody, they've been ripped off by the oil companies. They will smell some kind of conspiracy that somebody's to blame all for this. And when people feel themselves defrauded or conspired against, they often overreact. So you could even, even see sort of violent scenes around filling stations in, in suburban America. Um, simply because the unfortunate people have not been properly told. Suburbia has very poor prospects for the future. Uh, but unfortunately, so many generations of Americans are now used to it and, and it has become so normal that there's going to be a tremendous struggle to maintain it against all the terrible events that are coming down at us. And I think what you'll see is an attempt in North America to maintain the entitlements of suburbia long after the world has made it clear that you just simply can't continue living that way. Oil depletion and the price of oil increase will, will have a devastating effect on those communities, which will translate into political upheavals because I think it, it, because it is people in the, these sprawling suburbs who carry a disproportionate weight in American elections. This will create tremendous pressure on politicians to solve the problem somehow by procuring more petroleum some way. I don't think there's a solution to this, but it will create tremendous stress on the political system. I, I think that Americans will elect maniacs who promise 
to allow them to keep their McMansions and their housing and their commutes and their suburbs and their big box stores, no matter what the, you know, what historical events have to say about it. And that's going to produce a lot of uh, uh, political friction, I think probably a lot of violence, probably uh, a threat to our democratic institutions, and, and it will call into question whether or not we can continue this project of civilization in the context of a democratic republic. You know, I'm not saying that there's going to be a dark age, but I do see a lot of potential for darkness. There's going to be a great scramble out there to get out of the suburbs. There's going to be a sort of fight over the table scraps of the 20th century out there. I use the term cluster f to describe what we're heading into. Uh, I, I think that the suburban uh, destiny is a pretty hopeless situation. And uh, I think it's going to be a big mess. It's going to be a political, economic, and uh, uh, social storm. And we're not prepared for it. And, you know, I use that term because it shocks people. But I use it because I think people need to be shocked into the awareness that we've got to start preparing for a real problem. I think there's a great deal of natural resistance at the political level to trying to communicate anything to consumers, voters, about the need to change lifestyles. Where's the media in all this? Why are, uh, why is the American public not being clued in or educated or informed? Well, that's really an amazing, baffling mystery. I thought I told you to kill that story. It'll cost us a lot of advertising. If that story goes out, I quit. All right. The media are silent on the subject of depletion, energy resource depletion, because uh, there's no upside for them. Um, if they decide to tell the, uh, the people of North America that, in fact, we are running out of the very resources that, that fuel economic growth, uh, well, does that make anybody's stock price go up except for a few tiny niche companies that make solar panels and, and wind turbines? The major media have been staggeringly irresponsible about this. And... You know, it may be because the attention span of the people in the media is as short as the uh, attention span of the, the American public. They are the American public, after all, you know. Um, uh, it's just bewildering and mystifying. The hardest thing to accomplish right now is, is to uh, get America's attention away from, you know, recreational shopping at the mall and Jennifer Lopez and playing computer games and uh, NFL football and NASCAR and uh, all their other current preoccupations. Reality is bad for business. What's good for business is the fantasy. We're happily existing in that, that bubble of the consensus trance. The idea that everything's okay and everybody agrees that everything's okay. The coming global oil crisis is very, very bad news. Yet the facts of oil depletion have been glaringly absent from the media. Few of us are aware of the extent to which our lives depend on cheap fossil fuels, and we have not been prepared for the shocks the coming crisis will bring. We are a society addicted to oil, and we don't want to hear that it's going to run out. The title of tonight's uh, presentation is, Is America Running Out of Gas? We are making decisions now in our lives, and decisions are being made for us that will determine the fate of future generations. We are living in the age of the greatest empire the world has ever seen, and it is an empire of oil. Where is the oil that's left? We've heard it three or four times tonight. 60% of all the recoverable oil on the planet is in the Persian Gulf. And so comes the Carter Doctrine in 1979, which says that the oil in the Middle East is of strategic importance to the U.S., and we will use our military to def defend our access to it. The world is already in a position 
where we are not fighting over major oil reserves, we're fighting over scraps. Enter the neocons. They have a plan. It's, it's a plan, in fact, for world domination. They make no secret out of it. You can read it in the uh, documents widely available on the Internet, including from their own websites, the Project for the New American Century. The domination of the world will first require, require the domination of the planet's dwindling energy resources. Iraq was intended as the opening act in, in a general reshaping of the Middle East and Central Asia. We've been told by our president and vice president to expect war for the remainder of our lifetimes. The U.S. would not be in Iraq if that country didn't have oil. Uh, the only interest of the U.S. in the Middle East is oil. Certainly from a military standpoint, we are witnessing a sequential war to control the last remaining oil reserves on the planet. That's the war that will not end in our lifetimes. I think this war in Iraq was really what stimulated everybody's interest in this subject. Ironically, it did a bit of good, you could say, in that regard, because people would say, why the hell would you want to invade Iraq unless, unless it had a critical role in oil? And it's now evident these weapons of mass destruction don't exist and never did exist, so there has to be some other reason. The United States must deny any possible competitor on the world stage from controlling the resources. Afghanistan and uh, Iraq are the two opening engagements in what are, what are bound to be a long series of wars and international contests over the remaining oil in the world. And over 60% of that oil is located in places where uh, people don't like us very much. What we're doing now is that, you know, we're expending a lot of uh, money and energy in the direction of securing those overseas oil supplies. Can we control the pipelines and the wellheads and the refineries? I doubt it. All it takes is five pounds of plastic explosive and a camel to put down an oil refinery. We're spending $50 billion a year in other countries in, in the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and so on, already, and then add to that tens of billions of dollars for Iraq, this starts to add up. This is, this is having a, a tremendous drag effect on the U.S. economy, resulting in uh, increasing uh, government debt, both domestic and uh, foreign debt. Then, of course, there's the, the cost in human life, Americans coming home in body bags. Then there's the cost in American civil liberties. The American people are not going to sit back and watch this foreign policy of occupation and invasion continue indefinitely. And so there's going to be more and more dissent. So how is the government going to deal with dissent? Well, already we, we see there have been laws put in place like the U.S. Patriot Act, so-called which um, significantly erode constitutional protections for freedom of speech and an assembly and privacy. Are these going to be used against average Americans who simply decide to voice their, their disgust with U.S. foreign policy? I think that's entirely likely. You will see a lot more global conflict. You will see a draft re-instituted re in the U.S. and you will see lots of protests. You'll see lots of young men and women dying overseas in conflict. This is the infinite war. As this game of musical chairs unfolds across the planet, the Department of Defense put out the notice asking for volunteers to serve on selective service draft boards. Do you think Cheney was kidding when he said a war that won't end in our lifetimes? Do you think Cheney was kidding when he said this is going to be the biggest conflict that we've ever seen? It's happening. Okay, so what's the alternative? Surely we can get our energy from some source other than fossil fuels. If we had 50 years to say, well, in 50 years we can get 25% of our energy, yes, that'd be quite realistic. But 50 years from now, no. 10 years from now, no. Five years from now, we'll be past the oil production peak and we'll be needing much more than that. There's no combination of so-called alternative fuels 
that are going to allow us to run what we're running in the United States uh, the way we're running it now on oil and natural gas. No amount of solar or wind uh, or even nuclear is going to allow us to continue living this way of life. A lot of people think that uh, hydrogen is going to rescue us. And I, I think hydrogen is an, an interesting example of a kind of a public delusion, the kind of delusion that arises when people start to feel frightened. And, and they have reason to be frightened because we don't have a plan B. People need to ask very serious questions about alternative energy before jumping into a lifeboat that they have no idea whether it's going to float or not. And we see a whole bunch of almost hysterical uh, applause for hydrogen. Hydrogen is a joke. It is a myth. We will not have a hydrogen economy. Hydrogen is not a form of energy. It's a form of energy storage. And all hydrogen now is produced from some other substance which requires the input of energy. Generally, it takes more energy to make hydrogen than you get from the hydrogen. It's fabulous because you only have to have electricity and water. Uh, well, to have electricity, you have to have some other form of energy. The single easiest way to create hydrogen is using methane. Methane is just a scientific term for natural gas. So in a world that we're short of natural gas, the last thing we need is a brand new user. Hydrogen is tremendously problematical uh, as an element. It's very hard to, to transport it. Advocates of compressed hydrogen say, well, I, I can get a 300-mile uh, range on a car with 190 gallons of compressed hydrogen in a vehicle. I say, great. Who's going to do the crash tests on that? You also have to look at infrastructure requirements. 600 million internal combustion-powered vehicles on the planet, 200 million in the United States. People say, we'll just go to hydrogen cars. Who's going to build the hydrogen cars? Somewhere around 90 barrels of oil goes into the, the energy to make one car. Who's going to pay for the factories? Where's the capital for the factories? Where are the filling stations? We're just going to take everything we're running now on, on oil, and we're just going to change it out, and we'll run it on hydrogen instead. Not going to happen that way. Net energy. Energy return for energy invested. And people just don't think about this. If you're converting biomass into diesel, how much energy went into creating that biomass? If it's plant mass, how much fertilizer, oil, water went into creating that? You have to complete the full equation from start to finish. Ethanol is a net energy loser. It takes more gasoline to create and fertilize the corn and to convert it to alcohol than you get from burning it. It's mathematically and agriculturally impossible. There isn't enough land to do it. Even if we were happy, as we unfortunately are, to turn it over entirely to corn ethanol, we then probably wouldn't have much, possibly no land left for growing our food. And as you think these problems through, as we've been doing it from the wilderness, you see that there is nothing, there is no combination of anything that will allow planet Earth to continue consuming the way it does and go on our merry way. There are no easy or quick fixes for our oil dependency. There are no affordable, scalable alternatives. Yet the political will to address oil depletion does not yet exist. We do have one surplus, and that is a surplus of ideas about how to meet the challenges of living with less oil. Some of those ideas are coming from a movement called New Urbanism. It advocates, quite simply, a return to more traditional, walkable communities. The New Urbanism uh, was a reform movement in uh, town planning and civic design and architecture um, that started in the late 80s uh, among a group of uh, young architects and planners who realized that we were reaching a, a dead end with uh, the suburbanization of America and they, they sort of looked back on history and the way uh, human beings had done things in the past and they concluded that there was a great deal of benefit for us in relearning the principles of town planning that had been thrown in the garbage since World War II by the, uh, the traffic engineers and, and all the people who have been putting together our everyday world.
Ironically, new urbanists have been now criticized heavily for being historicist and back to the future and all the rest of that. And I don't think that's at all the case. I mean, you have to pick up the threads of, of culture and history and carry them forward. But carrying them forward is the challenge of new urbanism. That's the new in new urbanism. First, we have to just revive the idea that the town and the neighborhood and the city can be a wonderful place. And I think the new urbanists have been very successful in beginning that process. Traditional American town and the, and the great American city were fabulous forms of urbanism. Uh, even though we stole a lot of European architecture, the ultimate form, the classic American grid, both at the city scale and at the village scale, um, was pretty unique. It's just trashy, the kind of environments that we're creating. When we compare them to what we used to build, it's tragic. The marketing of contemporary suburbia has just become so abstract. You know, it's a dirty secret that none of these places are real places. They're not real communities that have any kind of social networks or economic networks. They're just dormitories on cul-de-sacs. So the marketing of them is strictly, uh, you know, abstract and sentimental, really. The, the housing developments are always named after the things they destroy. You know, so if, the, if it's called Quail Run, you know, it means the quails have all been exterminated. If it's Oak Ridge, it means there's no oaks left. Even people who live in suburbia uh, find it rather easy to ridicule it. So that tells you something about, you know, what the real deep basic awareness is of its shortcomings. You know, it really hasn't delivered what it promised. It's not really real country living. It's kind of a mockery of the idea of country living. Everybody votes against sprawl. They hate strips and subdivisions and all the rest of the, the garbage that we build. And they love their historic main streets and older neighborhoods that are more diverse and, and uh, more human scale. The cultural inertia is tremendous. The home builders have certain ways of delivering their product in a cul-de-sac subdivision of McHouses. And they're used to it. They know exactly how to do it. It's still working for them, and they don't want to change. I actually think the trend, in, especially in housing, is pretty clearly away from traditional subdivisions when people are given a choice. We designed this project in Denver called Stapleton. Stapleton's been redeveloped along the urbanist lines, and it now sells at a premium of about 25% compared to typical subdivisions in the same region. What that demonstrates to me is that the marketplace really wants more walkable and more diverse neighborhoods. Pretty soon, you know, because of the oil situation in the world, you know, the new urbanism will be the only urbanism. Circumstances are going to compel us to live differently uh, in North America, whether we like SUVs or not. I think it's more important to, to rest the, the alternative strategies on the multiplicity of implications rather than trying to re be reductionist here and say this is an energy issue. Maybe the global warming issue is yet another one uh, to address in rethinking our patterns of development. There should be, and there are, a million good reasons for good urbanism. In any case, the suburban idea, really, as it has been known in the late 20th century, is really coming to an end. It is hard to imagine that all this, even now under construction, may lose much of its value in the coming years, that the suburban way of life may become increasingly dysfunctional as the global oil crisis deepens. The new urbanism offers one possible alternative, to make our communities livable, walkable, quieter places once again, to make our communities sustainable. But this initiative may be too little too late for the many who already live here. The residential subdivisions don't have very good prospects for being retrofitted because you can't really move the houses closer together. I mean, you know, that would be pointless. Most of the optimistic ideas about repairing suburbia kind of revolve around uh, fixing up the, the shopping centers and turning them into mixed-use 
places where people can live and work and buy stuff. And in other words, turning what were single-use places into true urban villages. The thing about sprawl is you've got all these big arterial roads that are oversized, and they've got all this strip development on the edges, which is basically underutilized land, one-story buildings with big surface parking lots. So you have these huge ribbons, which are also perfectly located for transit, and then allow high-density development to redevelop those corridors. You can completely reconstruct that strip because nobody's in love with this strip. And all of a sudden, those neighborhoods have something to plug into, to walk to. And all of a sudden, there's urban environments that young people and older people who don't want yards can live in. I myself am a little pessimistic about the kind of resources that we're going to have available to do that. You know, uh, we're actually now leaving behind this tremendously affluent period when we had all this great wealth. We're now entering a period when we're going to just have less money and, and less ability to invest in the future. So I think that what we're going to see is a, you know, a lot more kind of provisional, impromptu kind of behavior. You know, people sort of making do the best they can with the remnants of, of what, what remains. First ring suburbs are already becoming the ghettos. They don't have the underlying beauty and structure of our historic cities and towns to kind of rebuild on. So they become quite a challenging situation. But I don't think that's something that might happen. It's something that is happening. The suburbs that were really built after the 1960s, the ones that are really past the inner rings, are going to become pretty deeply dysfunctional. We may see, you know, more than one family living in a McMansion, and we may see them growing crops on what used to be the front lawn, but I think that they'll basically be the slums of the future. I think we're going to see a, a meltdown in the value of this living arrangement that we've created in North America. This tremendous infrastructure for daily life that is not going to function very well in a world that doesn't have cheap fossil fuel. What will happen to this massive suburban landscape as the crisis deepens? While some believe there exist few prospects for this way of life, others believe there are ways to adapt to the new realities of the 21st century. Great crises, by, by definition, are problems that got ignored until they were enormous problems. And I think we have a great crisis coming in energy. What I'm most worried about is how long we've left even addressing the issue. And the longer we ignore the issue, the more painful the problem will become. If you start appreciating how finite and fragile the use of energy is, you, you know, there, there, there are small things that can be done. Can any individual solve the problem? On a, no. No. It takes a massive collective wake up. The crux of the issue, I think, for, for most ordinary people is we're going to have to live more locally. And we're going to have to at least prepare mentally to do that. You know, ask yourself, you know, what kind of job am I going to have in 10 years? You know, I'm thinking about that myself. You know, I, I'm an author, but I, de I depend on the trade publishing industry to do my thing. You know, the trade publishing industry might not exist in 10 years the way it has been, you know. Um, it's occurred to me that, I, you know, I would start a local newspaper. Luckily, technology has really allowed a lot of people, if they wanted to, to probably work at home. Find a way to live uh, with, with uh, fewer car trips, with less driving, becoming less car dependent if you possibly can, because believe me, we're going to have to do that in the future. Start paying attention to how you use energy. Pay attention to the fact that energy costs were too cheap. Uh, and they need to be a lot more expensive. One of the most common th themes that I've heard, which I really think would be a good outcome of, uh, of peak oil, is that I'm 52, my parents were raised in the Depression, is that there was a strong sense of neighborhood and a sense of community, that there was a sense of local place uh, that will be an inevitable outcome of peak oil with a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth and a lot of uh, tantrum throwing but I think people will learn how to become neighbors again. That may be a good thing for suburbia. What we will end up doing is, is creating a, a, a lot more localized creation of energy sources. So that if you have an energy problem, it's the problem for your village versus the problem for one third of the United States.
alternative energies are going to be at best small lifeboats made available in local communities by people who say, nobody's going to do this for me. We have to do it for ourselves. We have to get solar in our neighborhood to wire our apartment right now. We have to spend whatever it takes because the grid's going to go down. We have to find ways to cr create biodiesel in our own community. The, 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 this uh, peak oil is going to reverse globalization. Survival will happen from a local basis, and we're going to see local economies. That's the only way the human race is going to survive. Somehow or another, out of all these great problems comes some great ingenuity. And I think that you know we'll probably look back 20 years from now and say, look at all the new things we developed as we basically got serious about our energy problems. 20 years from now, there will still be oil in the ground. 200 years from now, somebody somewhere will still be pumping it. But soon, within our lifetimes, the growing energy demands of the American dream here in suburbia will eclipse our planet's ability to provide it. Will we learn to dream of something better for the world to come? Suburbia started out as this impulse to flee from the city and it was a pretty successful thing for what it was during the time that we were able to do it, you know, namely the oil age. It had a good, you know, seven decade run and now we are entering a period when uh, the suburban way of life is going to become increasingly uh, uh, difficult and dysfunctional and, and economically um, impossible two or three centuries from now, people will be looking back and, and formulating myths about the way people lived back then in that. I, whether they'll look at it as a lost golden age or an age of, of horrors and insanity, I'm not sure. I think it may be the latter. They'll look back on us and they'll say, my God, who were those people? How could they be so stupid? Irony was the ethos of the late 20th century, but uh, as we move into the 21st century, we're going to discover that irony is a luxury we can't afford anymore. This stuff isn't just funny. Our lives are going to depend on whether we have an environment that's worth living in and that can actually support uh, the project of civilization. You know, we're not just going to be able to sit back and make fun of it anymore and, and enjoy it ironically. Uh, you know, it, th th that part of our history is over. It's time to get serious. But right now, you can ride along with the happy ghost spending. Buy it now, young adults of today.